And the interesting thing is, I was so unwrapped in this book that, you know, you'd go home, you just couldn't wait to read it again. Well, about halfway through the book, I was told to go back to the beginning. And I was like, what? I don't want to do that. So I had to go all the way back to the beginning. When I got back to the beginning, uh, on page 9, I couldn't go any further because uh, there was a question. And the question was about having your mind, your true mind, was abstract. So because I kind of was blown away with that statement, which is probably why I had to go back, I decided to write David simply because I wasn't sure how to answer that question. Talked to Bobby, he didn't know. We didn't have any books about abstract mind. So I wrote David. Within an hour, he wrote me back. And he answered my question. So I was really, really happy. And I was so happy I just stayed on his website, perused around, bought a couple books, and within a day, now you got to get the dates on this because this is really neat. On May 18th, now today is the 28th, May 18th was told to start over. May 19th, I wrote David. He wrote me right back. May 19th, I ordered books. On May 20th, I received an email from Samantha who said, my credit card wasn't aligning with my address. Would I please send a phone number? 21st, I get a call, which I did send my phone number. On the 21st, I get a phone call from Samantha. Now, the 21st is last Saturday. And I said how fun it must be to work for David. So we chit-chatted and had a really great talk. And she said, oh, it was wonderful. Now, she's calling me from Mexico. So I thought that was really neat. And then the next thing I know, we were talking about the Peace House. And I didn't know there was a Peace House in Cincinnati. So I said to her, well, you know, I have a metaphysical directory called Community Pathfinder, and I would be more than happy to advertise for you, put you in there, type of thing. And I was really excited about it. So she said, well, I'm going to get you in touch with somebody. Next thing you know, I get another phone call from Ricky. Ricky's in New Mexico. 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 She's in Mexico. This is all happening really, really quickly last Saturday. So I'm thinking, okay, they're going to hook me up with the Peace House. That's what these phone calls are about. And I'm really excited, and I'm thinking, oh, Margie and I, and Margie's with Community Pathfinder with me, her and I, and I'm thinking, we'll just go down there and see if we can look around. Of course, you can't do that, and I didn't know that, because this is only for members. I'm still excited, because I'm talking to them and talking about David, and then she says to me, calls me back. I'm on a two-way with both of them. They're telling me all about the Peace House, and... Then I get one more phone call, and she says, okay, he's on his way. He's coming. It's all lined up. And I'm thinking, he's coming. <laughs> I was going to go down to Cincinnati to the Peace House. So who's coming? She said, David. I said, what? I was really kind of blown away. I mean, how can he be coming? Because he's all over the world. Because I've watched him on the YouTube. He's never in Cincinnati or Columbus, Ohio. I always see him everywhere. So I was really excited. I'm almost so excited that I almost, and, and Ricky says, now you have to calm down. I'm thinking, okay, oh, <laughs> She said, you got it. We're going to make this happen, but he's coming. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. She said, this is how David works. Everything lines up when it's supposed to be. So she said, you've got to quit worrying and just put out what you have to put out to get this going. So 11 o'clock last Saturday night, I'm still emailing back and forth, trying to get everything lined up perfectly. 11 o'clock at night, shut the computer down, it was done. And David was definitely coming. We put our emails out, and you are who responded. And they said, Ricky said, Samantha said, David said, who should be here would be here. So you have answered this call, and we appreciate it wanted to say that. Anyone who is interested in Community Pathfinder, we do have brochures upstairs. It is a metaphor, metaphysical directory for this area. We are much outside the central Ohio area. It's just a hookup. Anybody interested in healers or that type of thing, just that service back and forth. And like I say, Margie does a lot of that computer work for me. So thank you for answering 
my question because it hooked everything else up for him to be here. That's just exciting. So, all the books on this table belong to David, and I will take care of all those sales. Any of this book belongs to Bob Peters or any of the books in the store, and that will be held with John. John will write up those sales for you. At 3 o'clock, which you have a little clock up there, oh, we there. are going to break just to get you up and walk a bit. Come back in and we'll finish it till 4. And does anybody have any questions? Um, all right. Well, I'm going to turn it over to David Hoffmeister, and I'm so, so blessed. To oh, you. and I have... Uh, get my plug in. Yes, yes, yes. As a matter of fact, if you want to stand up, this is Cindy Nelson. <laughs> sure. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm Cindy Nelson. Nelson. This is my husband, Frank, and we have a couple Course in Miracles groups in the Columbus area that we um, offer. They're free. Yeah. And that's the information. We're on the meetup, too. So we'd love to have you all come. Sure. Be in our directory. I'd love to. Thank you so much. <laughs> we, we've never, we didn't know about this either. I'm on uh, David's email list, and I thought I didn't know anything about a, a Phoenix bookstore. So I'm fairly new to the area, so I'm happy to be here. Well, fun. Very good. Well, I'll, I'll add to that story a little bit, because that's Samantha, but Samantha wasn't the one in Mexico involved. That was Serena. So there's a, a, another one. So Samantha ended up, we had already had tickets to come to Cincinnati to spend a few days, and then all of this just swirled out with our friends Serena. Serena was the one in Mexico that you talked to, and and Ricky, and then this is Samantha's. Oh, that's Samantha. Okay, so, I so many names. So there's so many names. So <laughs> that, that was like you were sitting there. How did I? How was I involved in this? <laughs> Serena, you're right. Serena, yes. Serena, yes. Serena and Ricky. Yes. I've got a question yes. I'd like to ask you as well as the rest of the group. Um, this is making a lot of noise over here. The return air on the furnace for the air conditioning. There's not that many people in here. I could turn that off so we could hear better. If I get a little bit warmer, or I can leave it on and keep it cooler, what's, what's the vote? How many people would like for us to keep it on, but being a little bit louder? Raise your hand. Leave it on? Okay. Leave it on. We're okay. We've got it, and we've got our break for liquids at 3 o'clock. See the little clock up there? <laughs> okay. Well, I'll try to speak loud enough, and so... Hopefully we'll be all able to hear each other. Well, and, thank you. And also, he's supposed to talk about Unwind Your Mind. Unwind, the book. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I've come to, uh, I've lived in Ohio at this little peace house, and I've known Cindy for a number of years. It's about 2001, and so I have come up and through, uh, up to Cleveland, Hartville, Canton, I went to Columbus. I did a gathering. I think I did one gathering in Columbus, so it's nice to, to come back here. And as Kathy was saying, around the world, 40-some countries, so I just kind of go and, and love to go wherever I'm invited. But I think spirituality is a very intimate experience in our hearts, so it's not something that you really need to proselytize or convince anybody about. It's more like yourself, your own awareness, being convinced of your own eternal reality that's beyond the world and beyond the body. So it's it's not so much a religion, it's not, unless you redefine religion, which I like to do with, with different words in this world, I, I define religion as inner peace. So that way I can be religious too, and spiritual. Because <laughs> it's all in the definitions, you know. And, and besides, I would say God and spirit is far beyond definition anyway. So it's more like the Buddha said, and many great saints and masters have said, empty your mind of the contents of consciousness. Everything you think you think, every concept you think you know, empty your mind of everything, and then what's left is this I am presence, which is you, and which is God, and which is spirit. It's your true identity. So it's quite a journey. Welcome. So it's, it's quite a journey, but you might say along the way, uh, 
human beings are are part of a belief system of separation, so it takes a lot of rinsing the mind to rinse it clean and clear of all the concepts that it's all the programming, all the conditioning that's in there, most of which is unconscious. So that's another issue that people face on the spiritual journey is most of what they have to release is they're not even aware of. It's just assumptions. They're operating on a lot of assumptions, a lot of programming, conditioning that they're completely unaware of. So in my journey, I did realize that at some point that I needed ways to raise this unconscious up into awareness. And this is nothing new, it's been around for many, many centuries and even more recent psychologists, you know, dec even more recent decades as you go back to even Carl Jung was talking about the shadow and the unconscious, that the darkness that had to be raised up. So once I realized that that was what this was all about, then I was open to spirit giving me any way possible to tap into this unconscious mind. I figured if it was like a like a program running on the hard drive, uh, maybe like a virus we could call it, because it's, it's not uh, peaceful, a virus running on the hard drive that I needed the virus exposed and released. And that's why this authentic spiritual journey can be very, uh, very conflictual because it's almost like you get this darkness of your mind brought up and it's like turning your world inside out and upside down. Because it was upside down and you're really just turning it right side up and it's, it's a very intense journey. And many people have written about it. The saints and mystics would talk about how daunting it was. Sometimes people say, I wish I never got into this, opened this can of worms because it's such a deep can of worms and it can it's like a, it can dismantle the world as you know it and dismantle everything that you believe about the world and about yourself, your own identity. So, the pathway that came and dropped into my lap back uh, three decades ago was A Course in Miracles. And so I just gave my heart and soul over to practicing it, living it, demonstrating it, giving myself completely over to this pathway. And the Course itself says that you will believe this Course entirely or not at all. So that was a challenge. Uh, to go for something entirely means not to make any exceptions. So after many, many years of working with the Course, uh, I was just recently in San Francisco and I said, I don't, I'm not really an author, I don't really write books, I just show up in presence for these gatherings or meetings or satsangs or whatever you want to call them and then people record them and, and typically transcribe them and put them into books. So I don't sit down to write a book. I just show up and keep showing up and keep showing up and they keep recording and recording and transcribing and that's how this book that Kathy mentioned, Unwind Your Mind Back to God, came about. Actually it it was it started off with a lot of audio recordings and then there was transcriptions and then a website came and I had this website this is just a website this is it looks like a book but it's actually a website that I had for many many years called teacher of teachers just in honor of the Holy Spirit uh, some of you rem recognize that word Holy Spirit from Christianity Holy Ghost Holy Spirit the comforter uh, the one that, part of the Holy Trinity and so on and so forth. That's who I meant by teacher of teachers. I wasn't talking about a human being. I was talking about a I am presence that goes by many names in many different cultures. So it's not, it's not identifiable by something in form. Some people have said, including the Course, that Jesus was the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. So he was the demonstration in form if that presence would seem to take a form and be gentle, kind, loving, forgiving, and wise, then that's, that's like a manifestation. But actually, spirit is just purely abstract, to use that word again, and so abstraction doesn't really take a form. But it can be witnessed to by 
the form in a temporary way. Or, kind of like they say in the Eastern parables, it's like the, the, the monk or the master is just a figure that's pointing to the moon, pointing to the light. So the form is never what it's all about. That's just the pointer. And you could think of Jesus as a pointer, Buddha as a pointer, and there are many wonderful pointers, including books like A Course in Miracles, and including this book, Unwind Your Mind Back to God. It's a website turned into a book, and I think for people, probably in generations to come, they will look back and they will look at that book and go, oh my God, with all the books on spirituality, and there's many, we're in a beautiful bookstore here with many books on spirituality, the, I think the number one question that I get asked as I travel around the world to many different cultures uh, is a very practical question, and it's a very short question because it's only one word, and the question is how? How? Please, can you help illuminate me into the how? And I, it, my first answer is always, well, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the how. The Holy Spirit is the how. You're in touch with the Holy Spirit, or to the extent that you're in touch with the Holy Spirit, you have everything that you will need to know, and it will be given you on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, so there's no formula to the how. It's a presence. It's with you. And all you have to do is be in touch with that presence. It's your higher self, it's the remembrance of God, it's the voice for God, it speaks for spirit, it's your intuition, uh, it goes by many names, but that is actually the how. And for most people, they're like, can you be a little more specific than that? It sounds good, but I want something that's more practical. So this book and this website was made basically as the how. So how did the how come about? How, how did the, it sounds more like Dr. Seuss now, we're getting into doc, bringing in Dr. Seuss. How did the how come about? The how was simply me joining with my brothers and sisters, which back in the day, we'll say like the early 1990s, I was happy, I was joyful, I was living in a life of trust and a very mystical life, and then people started showing up uh, here in Ohio, actually, in, in Cincinnati, Ohio, people started showing up and saying a very curious thing to me. Uh, they would come up to me and they would say, I am your student and you are my teacher. Very unnerving if you're just going along and enjoying your mystical life and then people are showing up with this teacher-student stuff. Uh, because those are just concepts too. Those are just roles. But when it happened, I just thought, oh well, here we go. I've heard that when the teacher's ready, the students will appear. When the students are ready, the teacher will appear. I've heard that from other traditions. And also from A Course in Miracles, it's got a section in the back called the Manual for Teachers with talks about teachers and students. So at that point I thought, this must be what's going on. To put some words on it, this must be what's happening. So I worked with the students as they appeared, and they had health issues, they had financial issues, they had family issues, they had issues around the government, they had issues around the environment, they had issues around their neighbors, they had psychic issues, energy uh, issues going on within their mind. They had issues uh, related to diet and nutrition. They had issues, authority issues with police officers and government officials and lawyers and politicians. It was, when I came together with the students, it was, it was a, a little microcosm of the human condition. And it was very much like the ancient Greeks when Everybody remember Socrates, where Socrates was so open-minded, he would just come together with whoever and he would have Socratic dialogues where anybody could raise any question, any issue, anything at all, and Socrates would, would look at it with the questioner in a very deep way. 
and the point of the Socratic dialogue was to have no assumptions. So Socrates was really good. Somebody would come up and they would seem to know something and they would, pro you know, proclaim they were a prophet or a saint or so on and so forth, and Socrates would just, oh, okay. And he'd sit around him for a while and he'd listen to them, but he was had such a sharp mind that even when this prophet or saint was going on, would start to, you know, give all this uh, teaching, then at times Socrates would listen and when he would hear an assumption in what they were talking about, he would say, hmm, aren't you assuming this and this and this? And usually the person got very angry with Socrates, like, how dare you question me, I am a master. And Socrates said, just raising the question, you know, aren't you assuming something? Because I would say that, that spirit has no assumptions. Spirit, I am this, has no agenda. Spirit has no opinion. But that state of mind of spirit is transcendent. It's beyond what we would call human consciousness. And yet, we approach spirit, according to Socrates, by being willing to question our beliefs. And maybe come to a state of mind that is literally beyond beliefs. A state of mind called actuality. So, when I picked up A Course in Miracles, it stated that it was it was from Jesus, and, and so it's from an awakened mind, and it had some amazing things to say, including to learn this course requires willingness to question every value that you hold. And not one can be hidden, kept hidden, or it will obscure your learning. So it was saying the same thing that Socrates was saying. It actually was saying the same thing that the ancient Greeks were saying, know thyself. That was the whole point of everything, was to know who you are, know thyself. And I really had always enjoyed philosophers, I had enjoyed Plato, I enjoyed the ancient Greeks, I enjoyed Eastern philosophers, European, Western philosophers. Uh, I was very interested in the deeper questions, the ontological questions of human existence. I had even taken this philosophy class when I was in, uh, at the University of Cincinnati here in Ohio. I was there for ten years, graduate and undergraduate, but I was spending a lot of time in the library reading the philosophy and questioning the deeper questions. As well as getting good grades and getting my degrees, I was pondering those ontological questions. In fact, I even came across a German philosopher, some of you have heard of Immanuel Kant, but he was a German philosopher that lived in the same city his entire life. He never left, I think it was Heidelberg. He, and I thought, wow, that's cool. He stayed in the same city, he wasn't well-traveled, but in his mind he was well-traveled. Because out of all the philosophers I'd ever read, Immanuel Kant asked a very important question, and to me that was an exciting question, and he asked the question, how do we know what we know? I thought, that's a good question. I'm surprised some of these other philosophers never came up with that one. How do we know what we know? What, what does that even mean? How do we know what we know? Do we know what we know through our experiences on planet Earth, through our five senses? Or do we know what we know prior to coming to this world, even prior to birth? Is there some kind of knowing that we already know everything prior to even being born in a life of the human condition of ignorance? of time and space. So he called this type of knowing a priori, prior, prior to time and space. And now we have quantum physics, which is actually starting to look at consciousness and look at the, the mind and look at, wow, maybe we actually have all the answers and we've always had all the answers, but that this world of searching and using the five senses, maybe that's more of a distraction from knowing, instead of knowing as we think of it as human beings, where we learn. I mean, I was in, I was in kindergarten, then first grade, 
to sixth grade school, junior high, high school, and then on top of that, ten years of university, including a couple years of, maybe two and a half years of uh, graduate study. So that was like 20, we'll say 22 years of education. And then I start to read Immanuel Kant, where how do we know what we know? What if all that wasn't actually learning? What if all that was part of covering over what has always been true? And what if all of learning, as we think of it in this world, linear learning, learning things, learning more intellectual information, what if all of that is the cover for forgiveness, a cover over what Byron Katie calls, you know, loving what is? What if all the world was covering over what is? And when I came across the Course, that's exactly what was reflected back from a book dictated by Jesus Christ, was that uh, he said, yeah, you've spent many, many years, many, many centuries actually over-learning an impossible world that the Eastern traditions called Maya. He said, you've put a lot of effort into Maya, into learning illusions, but you never stopped to even ask yourself, why am I doing all this? You never paused to start to say, what's actually the purpose of all this learning, of all this intellectual learning? So he began to use, in the Course, words like unlearning. In fact, he was basically saying, you have to unlearn everything. It sounded very Buddhist to me. Empty the mind of everything you think, think you know. I thought, wow, there's definitely something converging here. And basically, that began the seeming journey of peeling the onion, of unlearning everything about everything, including all cause-effect relationships in this world. Uh, basically, everything that empirical science has, has taught us, everything that we've learned through experimentation and the scientific method, you know, I had such respect for all of that until Immanuel Kant and a few other philosophers started to say, well, maybe you should have respect for something that's beyond all of that, that's actually true and real. That all of this is covering over everything that you've learned in your ten years of university is part of a cover. So, as I practiced the Course and as I followed guidance. I was, I was actually, after about two and a half years, I could hear Jesus' voice in my mind very clearly. And thus began a very uh, quick, rapid undoing of everything, because once I could hear Jesus speaking to me, then he would, he wasn't just saying things like, I will love you until the end of time. I will love you always. You know, the stuff like in the Bible, it was, you forgot your keys. Turn left. I said left, not right. And it was extremely specific. You know, in other words, if time and space is like a labyrinth, like a maze of complexity. If if I could only have the voice that's beyond this world instructing me how to unwind, then things would go a lot faster. Instead of me just pondering and and stabbing in the dark and saying, I hope this works. <laughs> I'm going to try this, which is pretty much what humans do. We do the best that we can do. But if we could have clear instruction, we could really shorten this time-space experience and come to the present moment, the gateway to eternity, much faster by unwinding our mind from this self-concept, this belief system that was made to take the place of our spiritual reality. If I could unwind from the mass, and drop the mask, then I could come back to the reality, which is just pure I amness, pure spirit. In Christian terms, it's the Christ, not Jesus the Christ and man, because the Christ is not a pure idea. It's not male or female, or it's not even masculine or feminine. It's just pure, unconditional love, with no exceptions. Agape love, they sometimes call it. If I could unwind from the mask, then I could realize who I truly am, and who everyone truly is. It's not like you retain a personal sense of self and you have this vast sense of self. You open up to the abstraction. So in my work with the Course, I 
stepped out of academia, big step for me, you know, a lot of identity, 10 years, it's a lot of money, student loans, <laughs> time, effort, papers, exams, it's a lot of work. I got a couple of degrees out of it. They weren't seeming to help me very much with my search for truth, but I did the, I did the things that was required to get my degrees. And then, actually, as I went deeper and deeper and deeper, I was guided to move out into the woods, like Jesus and Buddha, Siddhartha had done. And so I moved into a little travel trailer in northern Kentucky, out in the woods, took my Course in Miracles book out there, and I said, okay, I'm not going to need all this uh, degrees and education. I'm going to need to learn how to still my mind so that I can be as I know myself as God created me. That's going to be the most important thing. And I was aware of traditional pathways, including meditation and contemplation and lots of very good traditional pathways. But in A Course in Miracles, Jesus said, your way will be different. A holy relationship will be provided for you. So basically I was told, you'll still get some meditation in there, you'll still get some uh, basically practices that will still be very helpful, but basically the core of your pathway to God will be through holy relationship and it will be through listening and following my guidance. So that made it pretty simple. I knew the context of healing was going to be through relationship and it was also going to be through listening and follow guidance. And there would be meditation and other things along the way. It wasn't discarding anything there, but it was saying this is basically the focus. So, I started already to have people come around me that were very interested in feeling the same calling that I was feeling. So there was like a little reconfiguration going on there. And then, down in the woods, uh, I took a table out into the woods and a friend of mine uh, named Beverly, we actually just sat across each other doing like an open-eyed meditation where we were just eye-gazing. And what happened when we were eye-gazing, I, I basically lost track of time and I was meditating but my eyes were open. It's like an open-eyed meditation and suddenly I was looking at Beverly and then suddenly the whole figure ground of the whole world started to shift and it went from a three-dimensional vision of Beverly sitting across from me and the woods, trees behind her, everything collapsed and it suddenly looked like a painting. And then where there was the, the figure, the outline of her body, this blazing light just started to stream through and it streamed and streamed and then the whole world disappeared. And I just went into a revelatory experience. That was actually pure abstract light. That was my first experience of the abstract. I was like you, Kathy. I, abstract, what's that? Abstract art? You know, do I go to a museum? But that was very, even the abstract has shape and texture and color. Even if you go to a museum to, to look at abstract art, it's still very specific. Specific colors, specific shapes specific sizes and textures. Oh, when the world disappeared, when the light came blazing in, later on I would hear Jesus call it revelation, or he called it the Great Rays, capital G, capital R. When Jesus capitalizes letters, you know there's something major there. Why was this capitalized? Well, it wasn't perceptual. It didn't have, there was no time and space associated with it. It was like pure I amness, or pure light but not the kind of light like sunlight or fluorescent light or whatever. This was like a, a light of wisdom that sometimes you hear talked about in near-death experiences where they're engulfed in this light and they know everything and they feel this unconditional love and they don't even have words for it. You know, the words start to fall because it's so unbelievable. It's literally beyond belief. It's beyond words. So. I don't even know how long that lasted, but all I know is the whole world disappeared and then it came back with a little bit of a, with a little bit of fear, yeah, the world came back. Meaning there was some unconscious fear of this light 
and even though I had a direct experience of it, the ego was not thrilled with this light. Because there was no ego in this light. It was just pure love. There was absolutely no ego. So, I continued on reading my course, practicing my lessons. My friend Beverly was actually, she was out there in the woods with me, practicing the lessons. There it was, working on holy relationship, forgiveness, and trusting the guidance. And the guidance actually took Beverly and I out of the woods. It took us out to a lake, and we were out on a lake. And we were in a rowboat, and we pulled the oars in, and it was so it was just the wind which is a nice symbol of the Holy Spirit, just the wind blowing the, the boat. And again we were sitting on the seats of the, of the boat and staring at each other, and we again went into an open-eyed uh, meditation. Again, wind blowing us along, very still lake, and eyes open, and boom, same thing happened. Figure ground, I lost, I lost the water, everything, it just all, the light came streaming in where there seemed to be outlines around her, and the light started streaming in, and then the whole thing, that was like, there it is again, another revelatory experience. Now in Christianity, it talks about that the, the light of Christ is beyond the veil of this world. It's describing this perceptual world as a veil, that when the veil is split, or, or rent in half, then, then this light can appear. And that was my experience again. Now for the second time, there was like, the veil was just split open by this light, and then the light just came in so strong that it, it literally pierced the veil, and then suddenly I was it, and it was me, and there was nothing else. And it was like also that there had never been anything else. There was no time, there was no history, there was no past, there was no future. Some people have said, what was it like? And I said, it's almost like if, if somebody had a fire hose of water and they shot it at your, at your third eye, like a fire hose of light. It just came at you and then boom, you, there was nothing that could withstand it. It was so immense and so beyond the words. But it was like getting hit with a fire hose of light and then everything disappears. So, continued on with the course, doing the lessons, out there in the woods, living very simply, you know, it was like Henry David Thoreau, uh, some of you have heard of him, a transcendentalist who, up in New England, you know, Walden Pond and all that. I was out there, I was experimenting with different kinds of breads, because I wanted to devote my life to this, and I didn't want to spend too much time on food, so I basically had a diet of bread and water, and I was experimenting with different kinds of bread, which was the most convenient, helpful bread, and the pancake one. <laughs> the pancake one in the contest. I thought, there's nothing simpler than psh, psh. You know, I said, this is amazing. I didn't even have to wait for the bread to rise. You know, I'm, I'm really devoted to spirit, so I'm thinking, pancake, pancakes and water, okay, we got our diet here. Well, the ego did not like that. The ego was not happy with pancakes and water. So occasionally I would leave the little hermitage I had in the woods, a little travel trailer, and I'd go into Walmart, and going down the aisles of Walmart, the ego was like, you know, it was like, cool choices and food and spices and flavors and da, 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 you know. The ego likes variety, and did not like pancakes and water. I thought it was a good idea. So eventually, I'm still down there, Beverly's still down there, and we, we go up to Cincinnati, back up to Ohio, and we go over to a friend of ours, a friend head of the apartment, his name was Rob. He wasn't there, we were going to spend a little time there. We were sitting in the kitchen table this time, again we're open eye gazing. Open eye gazing, this time across the kitchen table, and the same thing happens now. Not in the woods, not on the lake, now it's in a, at, across the kitchen table. The whole world disappears. Some of you in the course, my friend Gary Renard has a book, The Disappearance of the Universe. Well, I've had that experience three, t three times, and I just went right into the revelation. Now, every time I went into this revelation, when I seemed to come back from it, there was always a little tinge of fear. Almost like the ego was like, I don't know what that was. That is not good. <laughs> that is not good.
<laughs> would always have a commentary running on that, and it was not, it was a bit of a jolt, almost like being jolted back, and then he goes like, ah, got you back. You're mine, and you're going nowhere. You forget about this light, you know, because you don't want to go there. You will never escape from time and space. You will never know that light. You're, you're mine, and you're staying here. So there was a fear, a little bit of a jolt, almost like, you know, after, maybe that like you've come off of roller coaster ride or something and you have a little queasiness that's in the mind after the roller coaster ride, like it shakes you up a bit. That was kind of the feeling that I had from these revelatory experiences. But also, I had such a direct experience of the light that I thought, I know what, what my goal is now. And, and that is to do, to forgive or to follow the guidance, whatever I have to do to get back to that experience. I will do. I'll do whatever. Because it was such a strong experience. I know a lot of times people on the spiritual journey, it's, it's more of an intellectual experience because they read books and they meet some people and so forth. And, and intuitively they feel drawn to certain ideas and books and people. But it's not like a direct experience, it's more like a second-hand experience of reading something and having a resonance in your heart. Like, hmm, something's really right about this. And, and yet, it still involves, we'll say, words and images. Whereas these revelatory experiences did not involve words and images. But they were gone too. And so, when I continued on with the Course, Jesus said, yes, words are but symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. Isn't that fascinating, as we sit in this beautiful bookstore and we've got, a, we're surrounded by a lot of books on a lot of different topics, that words are but symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. They're, they're crude symbols that were invented by the ego, but that the Spirit can use to unwind your mind, to back to God, back to Source. So anything that the ego made can be used by spirit to take you in a direction opposite of separation, to take you back to oneness, to take you back to unity, to take you back to wholeness, to take your mind back to a remembrance of source, remembrance of spirit. So in that sense, the words, it's the use of the words that's important. Same with people, the same with symbols. I, I felt like as soon as I got on the Course in Miracles path, then I started to meet people who were very dedicated to, to spiritual awakening. The Spirit took me on travels where I learned divine providence. I had a period of like five years from 1991 to 1996 where I was just basically kind of like a hobo for God. I was, I was just moving around through most of the United States and some of Canada, just trusting that my needs would be met and every day I would have whatever I seemed to need. If I needed a bed to sleep in or a place to sleep at night, it would be provided. If I needed food, it's very much like the Eastern sannyasis. Some of you have read Eastern books. Sannyasis basically are out there living on divine providence. Or I think of St. Francis and Mother Teresa, and there's different symbols. Peace Pilgrim uh, is much more of a modern day example of uh, Divine Providence. I was doing my Peace Pilgrim thing, and I was learning trust. Learning that if, if I would simply focus on God, everything would be provided. Very amazing five years, because that undid a lot of what I learned throughout my whole life as David, and, and university. You, I, they just don't have classes in university on sannyasis, you know. It, I mean, I had to go to the library to discover Peace Pilgrim. I, there was no class on Peace Pilgrim. Peace Pilgrim probably would have been thought of by the professors as some kind of vagrant, wandering woman, walking around with white hair and crazy. And actually, I think she was one of the most loving, peaceful women, examples of modern-day uh, examples of spirituality in action, because she trusted. She went all over the place. She walked and walked and walked, even when she had gray hair. She walked the Appalachian Trail. She walked all over the United States, and she was just an example of that. 
So I, I described that period. I was just in San Francisco, and I was telling the group out there. I was kind of like a mix of St. Francis and Peace Pilgrim. But I didn't have a house. I didn't have a, a car. I, 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 I did, later on, I would get a, a car, a little three-cylinder car. That was back in the days when gas was less, it was actually less than it is now. It's not, it's pretty low now, but it was even lower there, so I could scoot all over the place on, on a tank of gas. So, eventually I continued on, had students, uh, began to travel, more travel, more travel, and then uh, made this website, and then it turned into this book. And actually, this book, it looks like just a book, but it's actually three books. It's actually got three different books in it. And the first book is Laying the Foundation, which is it would make sense that that would be the first of, of almost like a trilogy of books. Laying the Foundation, and that goes on for, yeah, it's, it's a lot of Laying the Foundation, it's still Laying the Foundation. Ah, then we get into the second book, which is the middle of this book, Unlearning the World. Laying the Foundation, Unlearning the World, and then if you go far enough, let's go to go here, still, book three finally appears not really even a third, it's just at the very end. Once you've got through laying the foundation and unlearning the world, you're just about home. Then you get to book three, which is transfer of training. Transfer the training that you've learned now to, to make no exceptions. Realize that the truth is true and only the truth is true, and that the truth doesn't have any exceptions. Realize that there's no order of difficulty in miracles. There's not greater miracles and smaller miracles. They're all the same. It reminds me of Jesus. How could somebody heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, and then he not only raised the dead, he pulled a raise the dead experience with the body of Jesus even at the end. <laughs> Almost like for the finale, you know. He, he really taught that there was no order of difficulty in miracles that there was nothing that miracles could not overcome because of their transcendent nature and because of their source. They come from God. And so, book three is transfer of training. And that means as you go and you live your life, you, you live it and you demonstrate it. You live it in your attitude. Your attitude is kind, is friendly. Your attitude is is op you're very open-minded, open-hearted. You're very welcoming. Uh, it's a fearless, fearless state of mind as well. You demonstrate that, that certainty of, of who you are, that love that you are, without exception. You just, you, you can't go around making exceptions and say, what about this, what about that? You, you know, those exceptions are part of the block to the actual state of what love is. So it's not, I am love, comma, but, or I am love, comma, however. <laughs> There's no contradiction to the I am love. It's, it's quite a timeless state of mind, too. Jesus even taught, before Abraham was, I am, which seemed to anger the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, you know, when he was basically, at that point, a couple thousand years ago, he was, he began speaking, and basically the people around him did not like the certainty, the quality of certainty that was coming through that presence. And so they basically threw a question on him, and they said, by what authority do you speak? And basically, uh, he took a historical figure, which was the, the, the father of the Jews, Abraham, and then he flipped his identity prior to the historical figure. Talk about going back to Abraham, he went back prior to Abraham and he said, before Abraham was, I am. That's when they got angry, they started to get the rocks out. <laughs> it's like, it's beyond rage. <laughs> it's like, oh, what did he say? <laughs> he was saying, I am this precedes history. Before the world was, I am before the world seemed to come in existence, I am. 
I am the presence that is prior to this maya, this illusion. And, and basically he was teaching, and so are you. <laughs> that was the good news. He was saying, know thyself. When you know who I am, you shall know the Father. If you have seen me as I truly am, you should see the Father. He was talking about spiritual light, this abstraction I was talking about. He wasn't talking about visions, because God isn't really male or female or masculine or feminine. He was just saying, if you know yourself as light, then you will know who you truly are and who God truly is. So, so this book, to me, out of all the the books and the, the recordings and everything that's come through. I, I, I have nicknamed this book The How. I think for, for generations to come people will kind of marvel at The How. It's even got a little, like a spiral. Not a death spiral, it's a life spiral taking you back into to the divine light that you truly are. And so groups have actually started to form now that are studying this book which is kind of funny to me because I didn't, it's not really a book to me. Uh, it's just the how. But people are studying the how and they're finding that it's very helpful to study the how because it's got examples of people asking those questions like, my son injured himself and he seems to be fascinated with the injury and the wound and the scab that's forming. How am I supposed to look at this, you know, as a mother? How do I look at this? You know, they're asking very practical questions that are based on their identities in the world. And they're really underneath, they're asking, how do I loosen from this image of myself and get back to that light? So, that's why I call it the how to, because it's very practical. It's not just, all is love, all is God, all is one, om, om, om. It's basically really taking a look at your thoughts and your beliefs. Uh, some of you might remember there was a great singer-songwriter, Carol King. She did a song, Only Love Is Real, which is quite a powerful song. And in that song, she's got some lyrics, tracing a line till we can define the thing that allows us to feel only love is real. There's a lot of tracing that goes on in this unwinding. And basically, how the tracing, it kind of goes in a Socratic way because there's all these students asking me all these questions, but, but basically I'm coming from the experience that there are no problems. And the students are coming from the experience as if there really are problems. So we have no problems coming together with problems, and then we see in the book, how's it going to go? Are the problems real? And are they going to prove themselves, or is the unreality of problems real? Some of you might remember the Beatles, John Lennon uh, had a song <clears throat> that he called Washing the Wheels. People ask me questions, lost in confusion. Well, I tell them there's no problems, only solutions. Well, they shake their head and they look at me as if I've lost my mind. I tell them there's no hurry, I'm just sitting here doing time. I'm just watching the wheels go round and round. I really love to watch them roll. No longer riding on the merry-go-round. I just had to let it go. This is the lyrics from John Lennon's song, Watching the Wheel. Well, that was my experience of watching, just watching the wheels. And then, when I would join with everybody, I would say, come join me in this watching the wheels. And they would say, I would like to, but I've got practical problems. I've got too many problems that I'm dealing with every day. I don't have time to watch the wheels. I've got worries, I've got concerns, I've got sickness. I've got fear, I've got doubt. And I'd say, well, let's, we'll just see. Let's just join together and see if that is actually so. So that's really what Unwind Your Mind Back to God is. Now, so that, that was like the how. And then I'd say more recent books, like uh, Frank was looking at the book Quantum Forgiveness. Physics, 
Meet Jesus. That's that's the title I got. Because I'm a lover of science too, I really enjoy science. I actually realized that I was raised with probably the same science that most of us in the room were raised with, with our textbooks and our little laboratory experience. We were raised with Newtonian science. You know, it's if, if you can't measure it, if you can't describe it, define it, or whatever, it doesn't exist. You know, it's empirical science. It was Newtonian. But now I realize uh, that quantum physics and quantum mechanics line up with Jesus in the most beautiful way. So I was just basically, I titled it Quantum Forgiveness. I put that quantum word, very scientific, in with, tied it with forgiveness. And then I basically, people have questioned me on that title. They say, what does that even mean? Physics, meet Jesus. I've got some friends in, in uh, Europe that are offended that I'm trying to marry physics off. I'm trying to introduce them and marry physics and Jesus. And says, no, no, I'm just, I'm just, it's just calling out to the field of physics and saying, hey, I want you to meet someone. It's really going to make physics really clear for you. Meet Jesus. Meet the way shower. Meet the master. You know. I think that's proselytizing. It, it could be, but what I told them is, I, I think in Europe they were, they've, had, they've been burned out by the misuse of, of Christianity so much. And I said, well, no, actually all it is is, is just it's just an introduction. In other words, to me, physics is another pathway to God. Just like Jesus, or Buddha, or Krishna, or whatever can be a pathway to God. And I think, if we are really open-minded, we can start to realize that they all converge at the same experience. Even though they all have different like theologies and different beliefs to start off with. So I think, just like Jesus is kind of a starting point for people, uh, physics is a starting point for people. Theater could be a starting point for people. Music can be a starting point for people. And for me, I'm the most interested in where do they all converge? What that experience where they all converge? You could call it love or happiness, joy or whatever. So. For someone who has actually enjoyed science during those ten years of university and come into an experience of the of the presence of the I amness, not the man Jesus, because that's if you get into the man and the historical Jesus, you know, you you really you're back into theology. You know, that's that's still theology. And what I liked about the course is the course the miracle said that there is a universal experience, but there is no universal theology. So we have all these spokes of the wheel that all converge in the hub, but the hub is like an experience, and they all just kind of lead or point to it. And in fact, in less than um, 189 of A Course of Miracles, Jesus actually says, forget this world, forget this course. He's then now telling you to forget the theology that he's, he's using, and to come with open arms unto your God. So, in that sense, that was what I was really meaning by the title. It was more of trying to take the quantum and the forgiveness, bring them together and say that they're actually the same experience. It's, quantum physics actually transcends Newtonian, and, and true forgiveness actually transcends everything we've ever been taught about forgiveness. Like forgiving people, or the Bible said forgive 70 times 7. I tried that. It was 490 times and it didn't work. It, it wasn't enough. I still, there's still something beyond that 490. And then the other thing I decided to do in this book was, I didn't want it to be another, uh, another just group of words Hi there, come on in. I didn't want it to be just another group of words, so I actually included seven different movies in here for people to prepare their mind and then watch the movie or the Star Trek episode, you know, because I had to put a Star Trek episode in there. And, and then they would go into the experience while they were watching the movie. And that was kind of fun for me too because I know 
There's a lot of spiritual pathways that like to use, like drugs, for example, like ecstasy or ayahuasca and so forth. I use movies. I'm a non-drug kind of guy. I don't. I've never smoked or drank or I've never done any drugs in my entire life. It's kind of a rarity on this planet, but I've never done any drugs. I've never had a beer. But my drug of choice is movies. So I've become the one that can use movies, which I think are just modern day parables and stories, and I can let the spirit light up those movies so much that people are induced into mystical experiences through the movies and the commentary. I'm right on par with ayahuasca and ecstasy. <laughs> But, but it's not a substance, you see, it, it doesn't, it's, you don't have to go back to the substance to try to generate the same experience. You may go back to the movies again and try another movie, but you can even use different movies. Or at the same one, you, can, you know, it can happen with the same movie. But this is what makes this little book kind of unique, is because it's, it's got your quantum physics in it, it's got your forgiveness, Jesus' forgiveness in it, and it's got the movies and Star Trek episodes. In fact, I even made a, like a little episode, a friend of mine, Jason, made it and I use it in here. It's called The Emissary, but I renamed it to call it Time's End. Because to me, to my knowledge, it's the only Star Trek episode where they go through a wormhole and they don't come upon another uh, species or race. You know, the Klingons, the Romulans, the Borg, and this, you know, we're familiar with Star Trek. They actually pierce through time and space and come in contact with what? Spirit. Abstract light, spirit. They come actually in contact with the light, and the light is not a species. It's literally beyond all species. So the light has to use his memories of who his characters in his life and who he believes he is to communicate with him from pure abstraction. That's another cool episode. I mean, if you're going to watch and you don't know what abstraction is, then watch that movie and then you see, oh my God, it's just, it's just pure light. It doesn't, it, it can use forms, but it's not a form itself. It's not a species. So, that was good. And then also, going back to the students, I had a group of students years ago and, oh there's one that's open. It was actually, you know, I was raised in Christianity. I was raised in Christianity, a, a denomination called United Church of Christ. And basically, a lot of the countries that I've traveled to, I would say they're, they're basically part of the Judeo-Christian culture. I mean, I have gone beyond that. I've gone to India and so on and so forth. But many of the countries in Europe, Australia, United States, Canada, and so forth, uh, Africa, a lot of them are are part of the Judeo-Christian um, culture and theology. So, what I did was, I was working with these students and most, all of the students that came to and found me were all coming from that Judeo-Christian background. They didn't have Hindus or Buddhists coming, most of them, all of them were there. And they were saying to me, what you're talking about, it seems so transcendent that they said it's hard to relate to with the teachings from from the Bible as they had interpreted the Bible and a lot of their experiences of Jesus um, didn't really seem to meet with what I was talking about. They said there's like a big gulf between what you're speaking about and, the, and what we learned from our Bible teachers when we were growing up. And they said it's such a huge gulf, you know, we need a bridge and so I, I made a book that I originally titled, oh we're about ready for our break, I'll wrap this up. I originally called it the Bible Course Companion, as a, as a companion between the Bible and A Course in Miracles, that used scripture from both, and I would answer the same questions using scripture from the Bible and scripture from the Course. And I also made a book called The Fish Book, which has not been published, but it was just for the students. So that's, I would read this before I would travel around the country and I could go and, and go in any, any church. I could go into a Baptist church and they love me. 
everywhere I would go, because the Spirit would put the words in my mouth. Regardless of the theologies, it would use the words in a way that would inspire joy. Whether I was with an atheist, or with a scientist, a philosopher, a Baptist, it didn't really matter. It, it was the spirit of joy. I mean, okay, we've said we would take a break. So, at 3 o'clock, so it's 3.05. So we'll come back maybe in 15, 5 or 10 minutes? 10 minutes, that sounds good. Time flies. <laughs> I'm unaware. Okay, we're back from the break. So, <laughs> I've been sharing so much, I want to uh, open it up for curiosities and questions and things like that, because that's the most, always the most fascinating. You mentioned your open-eye meditation. Did you share with your friend Eric's experience with that, and what was, came from that? You mean yours, uh, to call it yours. Yeah. What else, or other later? Yeah, I think she had, I don't know if you can hear that, he's just asking about the revelatory experiences with, with my friend Beverly. I think she had, uh, she had deep meditation experiences with it, but it wasn't the same experience that I had had. And uh, so that was another good lesson, like it's, it's, that we may think others can share things, but actually revelation of all things, it's, it's, uh, it's not interpersonal, because uh, there, there are no persons involved in it. It's almost like it transcends the personal entirely. But I did have some experiences, there was a singer-songwriter that traveled with me, named Donna Marie Carey, and one time we went down to Florida, we were right on the, the Gulf, Gulf of Mexico, and we would have gatherings like uh, during the during the evening, so we would just kind of go, and we had some of those beach chairs where you real low, and we put our feet in the water, the Gulf of Mexico, very cool, and we would, we would meditate. One time we were there with our little chairs, we were actually holding hands and going into a very deep meditation, and my experience of what was happening was that as I went deeper and deeper, that it seemed like our hands were vibrating at a very rapid uh, way and then all this energy and then it was like we were t we were taken up into this light and in very very transcendent experience and uh, when we came when it ended I I just asked her I said what did what happened for you because I was quite it was quite an extraordinary experience and she said yeah our, it was like our hands started vibrating really fast and so she was reflecting what my experience was. And she said, and then she said, uh, I said, I don't even know if our hands were moving or not, but that was my experience, because our hands were just vibrating in an enormous speed. She said, oh, I, I, I peeked my eye open. They weren't moving. Um, but ex experientially, we both experienced the same thing. We both experienced being taken up into this light, and it was, we both had the same uh, transcendent experience. So, but that wasn't... It wasn't quite like the revelatory experience I had with Beverly, where the veil just parted and then it was just pure abstraction. And I would say that that's the thing about this journey, is that it seems like we would, we would like to explain and describe and share these experiences with other people, and yet um, miraculous experiences, Jesus says, are interpersonal in nature, and so we can get the, those kind of reflections back with certain of those miraculous experiences, but not revelation. Revelation is, is transcends the interpersonal completely. So there's, you know, you can, that's why in near death experiences, when they go into the light, they lose the words. They they can't even describe it because there's no human, there's no words that are capable of describing something that that transcends the words entirely. Yeah, of course. You, you did talk about your experience when you saw that light and stuff. What did you feel? It was just like so much love. You know, like I would have glimmers in this world of love, but it was just like such a strong sense of love. There was, it was also very much of a contentment, like 
a wholeness, a completion, like there was nothing missing or lacking. There was no, nothing to thinking about a future or the past. You know, it was, it was just complete contentment and complete sense of love. Like, like being engulfed, completely engulfed in, in love, at a, at a very intense, like full love. So, it wasn't like anything that I could relate to in terms of this world. It was just very, very transcendent. Anyone else? Could you tell us something about your communities in Utah and Mexico? I've, just, I've seen it online, yeah. but I yeah. don't know more about it. Well, to me, community is just a symbol, and so the, the symbol has been of, of devotion, of collaboration, of being used by spirit in some kind of a way that blesses everyone and everything. And um, when we started the communities, uh, I was just aware, I've done so much travel and I've been in, in convents, monasteries, ashrams. I, I, when they looked at my astrological chart, they say, you've got all this enlightenment stuff in there and all this group stuff. They said, it's the strangest thing to have enlightenment stuff and group stuff in the same chart. But it seems to be that I'm just so open to the use of all symbols by the Spirit. And I think for most people, just to be in a relationship or to be in a partnership or a marriage, that's, that's a big commitment already. You know, you're going to get a lot of darkness flushed up from just that mirroring that goes on, even in an, an interpersonal relationship. If you, I mean, I always say, when they say about communities, I say, well, the smallest community is two. And it's pretty intense. Uh, that's one little crucible <laughs> for awakening just that. And then when you start to have others, you can just imagine the, the mirroring opportunities that go on. Not if there's a lot of rituals and control and rules and regulations. You know, that's back to the same old hierarchies and I don't think those are, are really ripe for, for growth and expansion. But what happened when I started to listen to the use of community symbols was, Jesus was saying, yeah, you can take the rituals out. I mean, even the Course, A Course in Miracles has the rituals of the workbook, you know, so it's not like Jesus doesn't use rituals. We do need, the 12 steps have 12 steps, and those are very helpful steps, I think, anybody who's gone through 12-step program. But what I heard was, what we want to do is move away from that, and we want to to open up towards exposure and transparency, so, so the communities have two guidelines instead of rules or vows, and those are no people pleasing and no private thoughts. So the guidelines are meant to encourage exposure and communication, not to inhibit it. And it it's, can be lively, it can be <laughs> very, very lively when you have those guidelines. And we've got into discussions, lunch discussions about porn, I mean, every imaginable <laughs> topic uh, comes up for healing, for not hiding and pushing and repressing things. Um, uh, what was the one, in, I had one in Australia one time, where I was doing a week-long retreat in Noosa, Australia. It was a big group. We were like halfway through the week, and this man just showed up. And he was so sweet, and he's like, can I please join in? And I, I said, well, we're in a kind of a deep experience, but I opened it up to everybody else. I said, do you want, do you want this man to join in? And they all, yeah, we want this guy, let him in. I said, okay, it's Wednesday, we're halfway through the week, but come on in. So everybody welcomes us in, everybody explains to him, you know, we're, no private thoughts, no people pleasing, and they're telling him the whole thing and everything. The next day, he opens up with all of his pedophile thoughts. Well, that just about blew the lid off for everybody. You know, the more explicit he was about his pedophile thoughts, I'd go off and I'd have mothers in the group following me in, like, I can't handle this, you know, like, because they just weren't prepared. But I said, wait a minute, you welcomed him into the group. <laughs> you, were said, you said, come on in. So it, it's all for the healing, but it's like this, this whole idea of private minds and private thoughts. 
and that some thoughts are terrible and awful and and should be <laughs> kept secret or whatever and really the healing is really saying no we need to be able to to let everything up like the like Ali Ali income free let all of the thoughts come up for healing and for forgiveness so we've watched a lot of different thoughts pass through I guess my question was more about the organization of it. Is it just a, a retreat center? Do people live there year-round that they give up their jobs? I hate to use the word commune, but you know, what? What? how would you describe yeah. it? Yeah, I think some of the communes from, like, from the 60s and 70s, you know, it, it's, it's very much like the Essenes, like the Apostles, like uh, St. Francis, and so on and so forth. Uh, we don't have the vows that, and the, some of the rules and rituals um, that those groups had, but but it's all common property, and so and, and people do devote their lives to it, and they they bring along a variety of skills and abilities that get channelized by the spirit to for the benefit of really the whole universe, mm -hmm. because um, it's not like a pathway where where like I've I've written a book like Eckert's book Power of, of Now or something where it becomes it has a lot of notoriety or he goes on Oprah and so on and so forth and then it starts to a lot of people buy the book and then that's like a, an economic surge of people that are paid to do a lot of things. Ours is more volunteerism. It's basically very simple and it's we don't have any rituals or rules like about that. If we if we need somebody to do something like repair a roof or or do something that nobody has skills for, we either let the spirit do it through us or we'll be prompted and guided to hire somebody. So uh, it all works, but it's it's uh, it's very much. I think it has to be your calling. I know for me, it's it's been a calling, and and it's highly individualized for everyone on the planet, but. Um, it certainly has had its, a lot of forgiveness opportunities along the way, but it seems to be quite strong and stable, so it's been been going now. And uh, there's, there's a community over in Australia, there's one in Mexico, there's one out in Utah, and now we're just starting a, one up in a house in Barcelona. Uh, so people will just come and be part of it. And sometimes people it, there's people do come and go, or they there's a reconfigurations. People are like moved around by the spirit. I think in terms of of their learning, what's helpful. So that gives you a little bit of a, a flavor of it. Welcome. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? What yes. would you say uh, the communities are involved in? Because I know that from my watching of, of your videos on YouTube and reading some of the books I've derived that part of the journey is to not be devoted to causes in the world. And you spoke of yourself at one time as having approached the world in that way, being very educated. I can understand that. Yes. <laughs> Where you feel, oh, I want to save something out there. Yeah. So what type of missions are they involved with, or is it just to reach the, the individual's minds to join in God mind? How would you describe what, what is done in the communities? Well, some a lot of it's just communication based in the sense that, with, like I say, I don't write books, so somebody's got to put these things together. They're big collaborations, either the websites, the books. Um, the skills are kind of channelized in that way. There, there'll be an idea that will start to catch fire, like, uh, like some years ago, I always love music, and I was a big Beatles fan, and um, so like we have a, a, a Course in Miracles monastery out in rural Utah that's in this canyon, and then there's a river that runs through the canyon called the Strawberry River. And so I had this idea, like um, I, I thought of the Beatles, Strawberry Fields Forever, and with field down there and the Strawberry River, so I said, how about Strawberry Fields Music and Enlightenment Retreat. So we did that. And then, I think it was around 2014, we did that for a few years. And people would come and 
they'd been taking down from the spirit these amazing lyrics. They were singers, songwriters, they came from all around the world to, as musicians to, to collaborate, to jam together. And we had enlightenment talks, and we had, I think there was one year we had a, a Barbara Streisand uh, uh, interpreter, or uh, what do they call it? Impersonator. impersonator that came, that sounded and looked like Barbara Streisand. Mm -hmm. were, I had met her years before. And we've had different people come. 2014, there were all those great movies, X Men, Days of Future Past. I've been talking about that for, for over a decade. The future past and the past past, and so I thought, oh, that's that's amazing. So we, movies like Lucy. So we did an an enlightenment retreat, a music festival, and a movie fest over ten days. So it's fun expressions where we g get to dive deeper into the experience. The latest one that's come about now is called Mystery School. Is anybody familiar with the the great? mystery schools throughout the ages. There's been these mystery schools that are very kind of esoteric and almost like hidden from view, hidden from public consumption, but there have been mystery schools around for people who are into this spiritual awakening, and that's the latest thing that seems to be going on. So, uh, I think, did we bring, oh, here it is, they've already made a flyer. They're planning on starting this mystery school. It's, it's something that, a term that I used years ago, tabula rasa, the blank slate of the pristine mind. And going into the mystery school, going into the mystery is more learning to live a life of trust just moment by moment and not having to have a future plan or a, a set uh, form for your life, just going and living in the mystery of not really knowing about what's happening in the world but feeling the joy in your heart of being in the present moment. So that's, that's kind of an example of, of something that people are very excited about now and, you know, they're just, it's like Pentecost, they go running around and they're so <laughs> excited and, and I'm just like, okay, very good, I'm happy to uh, just be a part of it all, but that's, that's what uh, one of the like, big topics right now is the mystery school. was curious about your peace house. I, I'd i never heard of you, and I haven't read your books a, a week ago, and so I've been seeing things online, but in your peace house, you have no speaking, is that right? No, I mean, it seemed like you were encouraging people not to talk, is that correct? Well, over the, the peace house came into being about 1996, and um, so it's been used in many different ways. I actually, um, there were some people that were there with me living and collaborating in some of the early years, and then there came a point where it seems like the people left and I was just down there in my peace house in Cincinnati, and I would use it kind of, it was my cave. You know, Buddha, Jesus, they, they go off to the mount or whatever. That peace house in Cincinnati was like my modern day cave. Because I was, like Jesus was all around Galilee and Palestine and so forth, I was all around the United States and Canada, and then starting around 2002, I, the Spirit just started taking me all over the place. Also Argentina, and then, I mean, all over the different continents and different countries, and I was used as an, like an oracle, like the Delphic oracle, I was like a Holy Spirit oracle pouring through me, but even though I'd go out and about, and I'd have all these translators following me and working with all these people, I would come back to my cave. And so it was, for me, a place of deep stillness. In fact, sometimes people have walked into the house and they walk into the sanctuary. It's like it was built in 1847. It's like bar, uh, wooden beams in the sanctuary. It's like, it's, they feel like they're in some kind of a church. If they knew how many hours of deep stillness and meditation, they can feel it when they walk into the room. And then eventually sometimes the people would leave and then I'd be there with the cats. I had two cats, an angel and tripod, and uh, they would go into deep meditations with me. Cindy's been down there, she's gone into deep meditations. So it was more of my cave is the way it was. Then as, as I started to do more and more travel, I think 
it started to shift a little bit more to almost like a little hub where people that I work with closely can can go and they can do their communications and then launch. So even though I'm here now, uh, uh, on uh, what is it, Sunday morning, we'll be seeing Ricky at the uh, airport. Rick, Ricky was, you described Ricky, she's coming there. She's She was like a, a rock star, singer, songwriter, who wrote to me years ago from from Tennessee, from Nashville, and basically she, all of her singing gigs weren't going through and, and she was just sitting in a motel with her dog <laughs> and just going deep with the course. And then she was, wrote to me and she said, I, I think I need some help. I'm, it, things are getting pretty intense <laughs> with her and her dog in the motel. Her job started to strip away from her. She couldn't get the same job she had before. So she's kind of like a rock star turned saint. And she'll prob she would probably come here if you invited her, she'd bring her guitar and the Spirit just pours through her now. But it took kind of years of purification. Because um, when I first met her, she, she sent me her album and then, of course I got it, I listened to every song and everything and she's like, talking on the phone, she's like, David, don't, don't listen to this song and don't listen to that. She was trying to protect me from the lyrics. And she said, you haven't, you haven't listened to song number, whatever it was on the thing. I said, yes I have. And she said, I said, you mean the one of the lyrics, I want to, I want to walk through walls and still get laid? She goes, oh God, that's the one. I'd hope, I was hoping you wouldn't hear that song. I said, don't worry, my ears can hear things. It's, <laughs> it's all in the, in the purification of our perception. There's nothing in the world going wrong or right. It's just coming to that joy and that love inside of us. So she's, she's just coming to the Peace House now, and uh, yeah, we, Sam and I have just been there and uh, we did get this, the water turned on, the electric turned on, the no showers we've had to go to my, Evelyn, my mother's 89 years old, we come from, we've gone there for, so we're, it's just kind of coming back, I think, more into like a hub where people will launch around the eastern half of the United States from the Peace House. So it's been used in different ways over I the years. I clearly had some misconceptions from what I read on your website. And not knowing you at all or the work you're doing except what Kathy shared, I went in with an eye to what do you do and what is out there. And it seems like you have this Peace House where people don't talk and you want to find this, you know, supreme state of being, which is awesome, but my question to her was, you know, if, if that's all you're going to do, why bother incarnate? You know, it's great to know how to get there and to, to live that life and be in that space, to know how to, to be, find that space, but if all you're going to do is be in that space, then why bother being here? So I, I, there, I think I was just a misconception from what I was reading there that that's what you guys were doing. And I'm going to go back and look at it again to see if it still seems that way. Because yeah. I don't know you or your purpose of yeah. what you're trying to do, and that was kind of what came across. Yeah, it's almost, it's like that old story of the East where they have all these these blind men, like seven or eight blind men, and they go to touch the elephant. Yes. And they all have a different description. That's kind of the way it is with my life. Because over the years, I've been doing this, working with the Course for three decades. So, and websites have been built, people have written newspaper, magazine articles, uh, they take photographs of me all over the place, India and Rishikesh, uh, with ashrams over there, and all over in different countries, down in Australia and China, Communist China, and on and on and on, to try to conceptualize who I am or the work I've been doing. You could take some of the saints throughout history and pull them together into a composite. And, and that was my piece of the elephant. Yeah, and that was the piece of the elephant, yeah. And so, uh, I would say that's probably pretty descriptive of, of the times when I, I was doing all this traveling, I would come back and just go into the silence there, except my cave, of course, it had 
uh, broadband, <laughs> so I could, even in my silent phases, I wasn't just sitting in like a lotus position, I w I'm sure I was extending. I mean, there's singer-songwriters that they'll be working on a tune, they'll, they'll send it to me, and I'll be like, wow, this is spectacular, and I'll share it with the whole world, and they'll say, no, that's just my rough draft, <laughs> you just share my rough draft. I came from an experience with uh, the Christ mind, where it was like, freely you have received, now freely give. So I'm a very much of a giver. And so, like for example now, people say, well this is a book, and they pay for it, and it's bookstores, and so on and so forth. Well, I just was going and traveling and sharing these teachings all over the place, and they happened to make it on a website, then they made it into a book. Sometimes it looks like it's for sale, but the intention was always, freely you have received, now freely give. So no one's turned away when they can't afford to pay. I've put thousands and thousands of teachings in audio form, in video form, in written form, on the internet. So, for free. So, so people tap into a little sliver and they get a, curious, like, what's this? And they find this mega library of things. Some people are more audio-visual, so basically they, they basically like YouTubes. And so they just will sit there for hours, or hundreds of hours. Um, one woman in Kentucky is even learning other languages by <laughs> I use it because I've been translated into different languages. So she she likes to learn her Spanish or some of her other ones by by watching the YouTubes and paying attention to the translations. Uh, some people like audio, so they listen to this thing called Spreaker, uh, where I'm off in China or all different places sharing. I'm a giver, so I'm like give, 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 give. I I believe that all that we give, we receive. And so, I'm not really into scarcity and lack. Um, I never really believed in copywriting anything, except when you publish books, you know, they, they tell you have to put that on there. So, it's like, okay, whatever. It's a website anyway that is turned into a book. Oh, we can put a copyright sign on it. You know, it's not, I don't believe in the concepts, and, and yet that's a big part of what I've done. So you've definitely touched on some part of the elephant, <laughs> that's for sure. Your beingness of, in your picture on the website says way more about you than, you know, you, what you just said yeah. right here, which would be great if that was out there, because, you know, I didn't get a feel of, you know, what you're really doing or, you know, where you're going with this, and I honestly, I haven't read the book, sorry, but, but talking to you and hearing you say that is awesome. If that was up there, then I would have had a better idea. Yeah. Yeah, Sam's something. a webmaster, so she's taking mental notes of <laughs> everything. <laughs> oh! <laughs> we can improve this. <laughs> Last night I was reading, and I can't remember if it's the orange book or another book. You package two together. That's what I bought on your website. But there, there's a question and answer in there about a mother and a daughter, and she's real upset because her daughter has come home to stay at the house, and she's having all these issues with her. Can you explain that what you see outside of yourself is only the reflection of the inside of yourself, so you're trying to get this mother to heal the internal, it, but it's such an abstract way that you say it, that I just want you to share that. Do you know what I'm speaking about? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's like this mirroring that goes on. The mirroring isn't really going on person to person. The mirroring really is going on mind, world to mind. So, so the biggest trick of the ego is this dynamic called projection. And Jesus defines projection, as he says, when you're trying to get rid of something that you don't want, you see it as if it's outside of you. And you can see that's where the whole concept of an enemy would arise, the whole concept of being abused would arise, the whole concept of being a victim would arise. If you somehow believe in betrayal or victimization or abuse or anything, those are just beliefs. God didn't create any of them. Those thoughts have nothing to do with spirit at all. But the mind that believes in them is taken this very powerful mind, it believes in them, then it perceives them. And then it makes it into kind of a loop, like a closed system, 
that everything that the five senses and consciousness witnesses is basically, it's just wit witnessing a motion picture of what it believes in. So, it's very tricky. The ego is very ingenious and tricky and that's why we need spiritual guidance to start to show us the unreality of those beliefs and those attack thoughts and also the unreality of what seems to be the external world. When you move into an enlightenment, to the enlightenment experience, you actually have an experience that there is no world apart from what you think. There is no such thing as, as an external world. And in fact, the, when you get into Lesson 132, Jesus will say these four words, which he puts an exclamation point at the end of them, there is no world, exclamation point. That's exactly my experience when I went into the great rays of revelation, like, whoa, there's no world. It's just all love and light. There is no veil, there is no world. And so, everything is aimed at taking you into that experience. Because it's an experience, it's not a theology. It's just an actual experience. So, I think for me, seemingly over the years as I would go through all these experiences, I would start to tap into this idea that whenever I was upset about anything, uh, it was like Jesus was telling me, whenever you point the finger at anything or anyone, you've got three fingers pointing back at you. And he would say, one for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I would always point the finger and I'd have the Trinity going, Oh no, it's not, the enemy is not external, it's not out there. You're, you seem to be upset about this, but really, you're not. Uh, it's also been a life of collaborations, like my friend Resta, I mean, back in the early days of the Peace House, she would, I had already done many, many talks and travels and everything, and they were back on cassettes, back in those days. And she would have like a Sony Walkman, this was, before runner, before we had all <laughs> smartphones and whatever, the Sony Walkman with a little headset, and she would listen to the cassettes in Spring Grove Cemetery, this large cemetery down in Cincinnati, and she would walk for hours listening to my teachings on cassette, and then I would welcome her. She'd come to the the house to come to the kitchen table for tea, and I would say, let's just keep it down to one question a day. You listen to all the teachings and you boil it down to one question a day, we'll have a cup of tea. So she would give me her question and the Spirit would come through, we would join in going beyond the question. And uh, one day she came in and I guess she heard something from Lesson 132 of the Course, There Is No World. She said, Jesus has done it this time, he's gone way too far. He's gone off the, he's, he's, I can't understand him, he's, he's, he's lost it. I said, what's, what's going on? And she said, he said there's no world. He says, there is no world. And she said, that's just too far. That's just, that's just absolutely taking it too far. And so, we sat down, got the cup of tea and everything. She said, practically speaking, what do you do with that? That's ridiculous. You know, what do you do with there is no world and everything? It's just, and I just looked at her, and I had, we had some tea, and I said, well, you just live as if there is no world. You live so in your heart, you live so in your awareness, that you're so intuitive, you become 100% intuitive. So you're not reacting and responding to the images of the world. Because they're really, first of all, you have to see the world's not, there is no external world. It's just thoughts. You're just dealing with your thoughts all the time. You're reacting and responding and interpreting thoughts in a habitual way. That's what opinions are. It's just thoughts. So once she kind of started to get into that, then as soon as we had our cup of tea, then she started, that was the time she was receiving all these songs from the angels. She received over 250 songs from the angels that would start oftentimes with us having a conversation. And that day the angels gave her the song, As If. Because I had said, live as if there is no world. And the angels gave her a whole song to reinforce the idea that I shared with her. So, like a whole different stanzas and chorus and all these different verses. It was all just to reinforce that. Sometimes I would be 
traveling, and she was traveling with me and I would give a talk and then the angels would write a song, they would have her disappear during the talk and she would go out with her guitar, the angels would download like an entire song and she would appear at the very end of my talk and she hadn't even been in the talk but the angels were making a song so people could leave with this song in their mind. And she, they would sing, the, she would sing the whole song that was everything I had just taught. So, that's probably why, you know, you re get a piece of my website, you can't, you know, there's so much over the last three decades that I couldn't possibly even say in, in a two-hour giving. Oh, six more minutes to go, <laughs> I've done the best I can do, can do in two hours. <laughs> And I think we probably have about 90 or 90 or 100 websites, so whatever website you came in, I don't know from where, whatever. Any more? Yes. Why so many websites? Well, I think it's more, it's kind of like a, I just follow the instructions of what Jesus wants me to do, but it's more of kind of a grassroots, you know how, like, uh, like the political candidate right now, Bernie Sanders has got more kind of a grassroots thing going, small donations from lots of people and lots of different angles. Uh, my, it's kind of been the way it's gone for me, uh, is that instead of like writing a book or a big book or a popular book, I mean I hesitate to say it, but it's like this kind of thing can do wonders for the Bible. I mean the Bible's been around, the Bible's probably the most well-known, popular book, you know, in, in, in the world, or most parts of the world, but people don't know how to tap into it. You know, it's a bunch of old stories to some people, and they don't even like the language of it, but this is very practical. And I think with websites, um, there's there's so, so many... Sure websites that are interlinking for other, like you said, grassroots, somebody takes a class and builds a website. Yeah, there's, there, there's some that maybe deal with more like, um, like the quantum physics approach, or some that emphasize more music, the music studio, um, some that emphasizes more the movies. Uh, the way I see it is that the spirit's the same, but the spirit has to use all these different tools called language and, and different things to bring people to the same experience. And so just one website, uh, you know, I, there's even websites now coming out with different translations, which are really helpful. But they require their own. You necessarily started. It's just about work. Is that correct? Yeah. Sometimes, okay. or or sometimes, I will get a guidance from Jesus about a domain name, okay. and other people take it and use their inspirations and run with it. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? We're getting down to our final few minutes here. It's quite a. Quite a journey. <laughs> yes. um, say something about forgiveness. Well, I was raised in Christianity with this idea of, of forgiveness being you forgive other people, forgive yourself, but but you were, you were definitely forgiving some kind of situation, a scenario, whatever, whether it seemed to be a mistreatment or an abuse or something. And so the premise of that forgiveness was you're forgiving something that actually happened, always. And working with A Course in Miracles and quantum physics and everything, you begin to get this deeper feeling that, that what you've been dealing with, the grievances that you've been dealing with, were perceptual hallucinations, like you were literally hallucinating something that it actually wasn't there. And so that's to me the major difference between forgiveness that I grew up with, where I was forgiving what somebody said to me, what somebody did to me, or what I did seemed to do to somebody else, which is like, like that's the factual thing of what happened, and now you got to try to forgive what happened. and. With A Course in Miracles and Quantum Physics, I'm really, it's a, it's a journey and to start to saying, wow, I had, a, I had a mistaken thought, I had a mistaken grievance, and it was acted out, but it's, 
I'm not forgiving what's true, I'm forgiving what's false. And that's where the healing occurs. Oh my gosh, I was totally mistaken. I had attack thoughts, the world acted out the attack thoughts, I released the attack thoughts, the world doesn't act out the attack anymore. How does that look for me? I get to go around the world, I get to hug hundreds of people, I get to be hugged by hundreds of people, I get to see smiling faces, laughter, I get to see these movie gatherings where people are crying because they have an experience of love that feels really deep and genuine and it helps wash away this uh, other experience that they seem to have. So to me that's the biggest difference. We're, we're actually, for, you forgive your brother, you forgive your sister, you forgive yourself for what they did not do. And that's, that's no uh, kind of uh, play on words, it's actually well, an experience. It is play on words because you just said that there are no such things as the outside world. Yeah. There is no brother and there is no sister yeah. out there. Right. Everything is inside. Yeah. So you're only forgiving yourself. Yes, in the mind. And, yes. if, and if you're a spark of God, how can there even be a wrong thought? Exactly. So why exactly. are you forgiving yourself if there's no such thing as a wrong thought? Well, it's good because it's a good question. I call that the number one asked question, like how did time and space start and how did separation and even seem to be if everything's one? You know, where did all this separation come from? That's an assumption from? too, that everything is one. Yeah. Everything may not be one. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a, has to be a discovery. But the way I tell people is when, when Helen Shuckman and Bill Thetford were the ones that were kind of taking down the, this course, uh, they got through so many chapters and then at one point they did say, Jesus, can we pause the dictation here for a minute? We want just one tiny question. How did this happen in the first place? And it was interesting how Jesus answered them. He said, well, he said, you can tell by the way that you feel, by the roller coaster. They were both psychologists, research psychologists. You can tell by the emotional roller coaster that you go through that you believe that it happened. And so, and to me, in the end, as I said, I'm not going to pick pick apart um, or debate things like like metaphysics or theologies and so on and so forth. To me, it all comes down to experience. At one point I had, I had read the course so many years that I would go around and I would go to a course group and I would, I would answer verbatim from what was in the course, but then somebody at a conference called me a walking Course of Miracles encyclopedia. I don't know about you, but I don't strive to be an encyclopedia. You know, that's just not one of my goals in life. To me it's all about the experience. What, what do you feel? And, and being consistently peaceful or joyful or happy to me is the most important thing. And then the theology all collapses on itself. So, yeah, in the end, it, there there really is even talking about forgiveness. It's it is just a a play on words, like you said, the idea that that there's an external there's world. Out there that needs to be yes, forgiven. that that's that's just as false as everything else. You know. So to me, I tried to be, like with these things, I tried to be practical by just putting, writing and speaking and sharing the things as I experienced them, but they're just all metaphors and tools too, books are. Uh, I've met people too that are not literate and they aren't scholars by any means. They, they live very simple, happy lives. So you didn't put that book together even though your name is on it? I spoke it. I spoke all the words. Mm -hmm. but. I didn't know there was other people. Yeah, they they transcribed it. And so you had a ghostwriter then. I type like this. If anybody <laughs> saw, that would take me a lot of time <laughs> to even type that book out. Because and my thumbs are not much better with uh, with iPhones. So it's a collaboration. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's well, been, thank you that very went much. through. I that went very fast. Thank you. <laughs> It's been fun. <laughs> It's been fun coming here.